I used to daydream about being old enough to go on dates. I had this image of myself. What is up guys, it is the Film Teen back again with another video for you and today we will be analyzing It Follows. It's one of my favorite movies at the moment and as always, before we get into the analysis, I will be giving you guys a spoiler free review, just in case you haven't seen it. Also, I want to thank all of you guys for all the support you've been giving me. The subscribers, the likes, the comments, just watching my videos, thank you so much. I love getting to talk to you guys, so all the comments are so great. So thank you for liking, commenting, and subscribing. Now, time to review. I love the way that this movie is shot. This is an incredibly atmospheric film, and the sound design and cinematography are just excellent. I even heard that the director got one of his favorite sound designers from a video game that he liked. How cool is that? And I simply love the storytelling in this movie. A lot of it is done with no dialogue, but through imagery and the actions that the characters take. Lastly, the thematic elements of this movie are really some of my favorite parts of the film, because it remains so complex yet so general at the same time, and it leaves room for tons of analyzation and thought. But quick sidebar would like to say that the general audience member would probably not enjoy this movie because it is quite easy to be distracted if you are on your phone or looking at something else because there are long periods of silence. And if you are distracted in some important moment, then you probably will get confused. But I don't really have a problem with that personally. I really enjoy the story. But some real problems that I do have with it are the fact that there are some inconsistencies with the rules of this monster and what it does. But I won't go too much in detail on that here because this is a spoiler free review. But if you are interested, you should check the movie out and honestly you'll see what I mean. And for those reasons, this is not a perfect movie, but it is a movie that I enjoy quite a bit. It even caught the attention of Quentin Tarantino. So overall, I give this movie a 4 out of 5 star rating. I'd recommend watching this under some covers at night with no distractions. Analysis time. Before I start, I do want to say that this is just one interpretation of this movie that I developed for entertainment purposes. If you would like to hear more speculation about this movie, I'd recommend you check out some of the analysis on YouTube. I'll leave some of my favorite ones down below in the description box. And it took me quite a while to get my thoughts together on this movie because I got lost on the internet listening to other people talk about it. So I will be linking some of my favorite analysis below. And I don't think that anyone's ideas are right or wrong, but I feel like it is really fun to hear people talk about it. So without further ado, this is my analysis of It Follows. Or it could be a stranger in a crowd. Whatever helps it get close to you. We start the movie with an opening sequence that establishes the thread of the story. A young adult looking girl is seen running out of her parents' sheltered suburban home. She is in extreme danger and she ends up far from her neighborhood, giving the last words to her father as if she is at her own funeral. And a few hours later, the girl's body is mangled on the beach, but what killed her is yet to be discovered. Cut to the introduction of our main character, Jay, and the narrative structure begins. Jay is a 19-year-old girl who hasn't left her parents' home yet. She swims in a large, clear pool where she is safe from harm. The bugs from outside are washed away in the water, and the two peeping toms from the adjacent backyard are kept at bay by the fence. Metaphorically speaking, she is in a sheltered environment. Jay's conscience is clear, like the pool. Next, we see Jay go inside and greet her friends to get ready for a date with a guy named Hugh. While at the movie theater with Hugh, Jay wants to play the trading game, a game that they made like I Spy, but for people that you want to trade lives with. She tries to guess who Hugh picks, looking towards a man on a date with a woman or a father enjoying an outing with his family. But she is incorrect. Hugh says he would like to switch lives with his father's son, a very young toddler. He ponders at how exciting it would be to have his entire life ahead of him. This round of dialogue shows the difference between these two characters. Jay is a naive 19-year-old who idolizes the privileges that come with age while Hugh, a 21-year-old boy from the city, carries a bit of disillusionment about some sort of unknown trauma that he has gone through. This scene also establishes this as a coming-of-age story. There are clear points in the film where a character is looking towards adulthood with idolization and admiring it. 
And then after the character matures, they look back and relish their childhood. And Jay is in for a rude awakening. They head inside the theater to grab some seats, but during the trading game, Hugh sees someone that Jay does not see. He gets nervous to the point that he asks them to leave. So he takes them to an eatery. Jay asked him, who was it? An ex-girlfriend maybe? But he avoids the subject. In her naivety, she lets him take her to a completely deserted location for their second date. And then she lets him sleep with her in his car. A few hours later, Jay lays down and delivers a monologue about how she used to daydream about getting older and achieving more freedom. But behind her back, Hugh prepares to sedate her with a drugged towel. She struggles for control as he slowly knocks her out. The daydreams are over. One of our story's first themes is showcased. Treating the adult aspects of life like child's play can lead to traumatic incidents or destruction. And I passed it to you. Whoever you are. Jay wakes up in her underwear in a wheelchair in the remnants of a broken building. Hugh has tied her up. He explains to her that he has given her some sort of supernatural STD. He says that it will follow her without interruption until it catches her and kills her. But he also says that she can pass it on to someone else if she can sleep with them before it gets to her. He warns her that if the entity kills someone, it'll start tracking its previous victim. In other words, she will never be safe again. We then see the figure of a naked woman slowly walking towards the pair. Jay screams, Hugh grabs the wheelchair and rushes to the car so they can drive off. We cut to her friends on the porch, late at night, one of them reading a passage about the inevitability of destruction. And Hugh pulls up to the curb and drops Jay off in her underwear on the side of the road before driving off. Jay stumbles to the porch and her sister Kelly calls the cops. Her friends Paul and Yara stand there shocked, and the cops arrive to ask Jay questions about the matter. The cops open an investigation on Hugh, and the neighbors from across the street can be seen looking through the window, calling the kids crazy, and this establishes another idea in the story. Trauma can separate you from those that you love, and bring you closer to your attacker. The ones that experience trauma in this story are separated from everyone else that doesn't understand it. The next day, Jay attends class at a local college. She runs out of her lesson after she sees an old lady walking towards her slowly from across the campus. She stops in the hallway and sees the figure walking closer and closer, another form of the entity. Others in the hallway do not see it. And this entity is not an STD, but the embodiment of death itself, slowly but surely creeping towards the youth in the story that try to grow up too fast. And how the characters respond to this encounter with their mortality leaves the room for plenty of analyzation. Some characters ignore the idea of their imminent death, but this leads to their downfall. Others acknowledge the entity's presence, becoming traumatized by its existence, but learning to survive in the process, literally becoming adults. An hour later, Jay goes to tell her sister and her friend Paul about her problems, but they don't understand. So Paul agrees to come over that night and help Jay get some rest. They discuss some childhood memories relishing their youth. And now that Jay has experienced some traumatic events like Hugh, she also longs for her childhood. She finds comfort in pondering her youth, a time before the incident that spawned her trauma occurred. But their conversation stops when they hear a glass break from the kitchen. Paul goes to check it out, and eventually Jay goes too and she is shocked at the sight of the creature. She runs up to her room screaming, and she closes the door. Her sister and Paul enter, and they want to open the door for their friend Yara. But Jay screams no, her friends don't understand what's going on with her. They think she's crazy. Like the neighbors across the street, Jay's friends are now detached from her, and they can't understand the pressures that she's feeling. And against Jay's wishes, they open the door, letting the creature in. Jay climbs down the balcony outside and rides a bike down the street. Her friends call to her, but she does not respond. The next shot comes from the perspective of their neighbor Greg. He's seen being very promiscuous, talking to a random girl in the car after already staring at Jay earlier during their class. Concerned, he along with Jay's other family and friends head to the park to see what's going on. Jay says that she needs to find Hugh, and Greg says that he can drive. So they head out. I need to find him. What did he really do to you? Apparently he used to... They drive down old streets near where they live until sunrise, looking for the address that Hugh gave Jay. They find it, 
an old abandoned house with no residence. Greg stares at Yara in a sexual manner. He treats his chasing of women like child's play. Meanwhile, Paul finds an old high school photo in the attic that leads them to Hugh's high school. When they get to the high school, they find out that Hugh's real name is Jeff Redman. Greg rubs on Jay's shoulder in the car, making Paul uncomfortable. They then head towards Jeff Redman's house. Jeff, like them, lives with his mom. They speak to him in the backyard. He apologizes to Jay, but he condones his action with the excuse that someone did it to him as well. This scene introduces the topic of the cycles of trauma how bullies can create bullies, and maybe even victims can create other victims. He is also shown to be extremely anxious when a girl walks by his backyard, reinforcing the idea that once it starts following you, you are never safe. They ultimately learn nothing from him as he encourages Jay to just continue the cycle. Disappointed and tired from their trip to find Jeff, they decide to head to Greg's family beach house. He says that his parents won't mind and Jay is faced with a tough decision. Will she or will she not continue the cycle? If it kills her, it gets me. It goes straight down the line to whoever started it. The kids hang out around the beach house and get some rest, and Greg even gives Jay a crash course on how to use a small handgun. And now Greg sets his eyes on Jay's sister, Kelly. But they're laying down on the beach when the creature finally reaches them. It attacks, grabbing Jay's hair, this is the first time that the main characters in the story are damaged by the creature. Paul knocks the creature off of Jay's head with a chair, but he takes a hit himself, sustaining multiple bruises. Jay shoots the creature once, but it gets back up, and startled by its quick recovery, she bolts to the car and drives off, leaving her friends on the beach. Her friends run after her, and she takes an eye off the road to look back for a minute. This causes her to crash, and she blanks out. During this whole encounter, Greg was off using the restroom, so he still has not seen this creature. Later, Jay wakes up in a hospital bed, with her friends sitting around her. Desperation and desire birth sexual relations between Greg and Jay, and Paul watches them from behind a door. He claims that he wants to help her pass the curse on to another person, but it appears as if he just wants to sleep with her. She has successfully passed the curse to Greg, but Greg doesn't think that the entity is following him. He still has yet to acknowledge his mortality. Cut to a few hours later, and Jay is back home in her pool, her safe place. The curse is no longer following her. It's gone. Right? Greg tries to come talk to Jay, but her friends don't let him inside. And Paul and Greg get into a disagreement as Greg claims that he doesn't believe the things Jay is saying about a thing following her. He heads back to his house across the street, but later that night, Jay is still unable to sleep. She scans the surroundings outside of her house, and she soon sees a guy walking down the sidewalk dressed in all white. She watches the figure pick up a rock and throw it into Greg's window. Frazzled, she tries to call his number, but she can't reach him. So she runs down to Greg's house and jumps through the window. She walks up to Greg's room and she sees the creature standing, knocking on his door. When Greg opens it, the creature jumps onto him and begins killing him. Jay sees the killing of her neighbor. While Greg spends his time indulging in his sexuality and ignoring his mortality as if there would be no consequences, by horror movie standards, he meets his downfall. His death falls in line with the earlier themes of the story. Treating an important part of life like child's play can lead to danger. Knowing what would happen to her if she stayed there, Jay rushes out of the house and drives off into the woods. She sleeps on the top of her car for the night, and once she wakes up, she sees a body of water past the tree line. She heads towards what looks like a beach, her safe place, and she sees a group of guys on a boat in the distance, and she starts walking through the water. We then cut to hours later, and she is driving home, soaking wet. Did Jay sleep with these strangers on the boat? Did she put the lives of others in danger so that she could buy herself some time? Yes. We then see her home's pool, now dry and broken in. Her conscience is blank, fractured even, because she has just contributed to the cycle of trauma in this story, endangering strangers just like Jeff endangered her. She falls asleep on the floor in her room, and Paul comes inside, waking her up. He questions why she chose to sleep with Greg, and she says that she already slept with him in high school, so it wasn't a big deal. That explains why we get the shot of her safe place being destroyed after she sleeps with the guys on the boat and not Greg. 
Paul manages to hold Jay's hand, but when he goes in for a kiss, she pulls back. Instead, Paul devises a plan of attack. We see the gang packing their car with loads of stuff before heading out one more time. They break into an abandoned pool and begin to take the stuff out of their bags. Lamps, toasters, hair dryers, and any electronic appliance that they could have found gets plugged into the wall and laid at the edge of the pool. Jay submerges herself in the crystal clear water, as if she's trying to cling to her innocence one final time. And after a minute of calm, the entity walks in. Jay gets nervous and cries out to her friends that she sees the creature. Suddenly, an appliance goes flying towards her face. The creature is picking up their traps and throwing them at Jay. The plan backfires. Paul then gets a couple of shots in and the creature falls into the water. When Jay tries to swim out of the water for them to start their plan, the creature grabs her leg and tries to drown her. But Paul hits the creature in the head one more time and stuns it in the water. Jay can safely escape and they watch as the pool fills with blood. This imagery at the end of the scene alludes to Jay's maturation, the official end credits of her childhood, and these violent near-death experiences that she has have stained her conscience forever, like the blood in the pool. Later that night, Jay decides to finally accept Paul's proposal for help. It rains outside while they sleep together on the couch, and while the rain washes away the old, a new Jay walks outside that day. She chose a partner out of necessity instead of desire, much more like an adult. Paul looks for women on the street to pass the curse to. And lastly, Jay and Paul walk down their sidewalk together, bound by their choices. Over the past week, they've grappled with their mortality and endangered the life of others. The main theme of the story? To become an adult, one must face their deepest fears and the darkest parts of themselves and accept them. You can try to run from them like a child or resist them like an adolescent, but both paths lead to destruction. To become mature, one must acknowledge and adapt to the ugly parts of their existence because no matter what one does to try and forget their trauma, it follows. That is my interpretation of it follows. That's the end of the video, guys. I want to thank you so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed this content especially if you've made it all the way to the end of the video. I really appreciate you guys' support, and I love to talk to you all. YouTube can be really fun, so comment if you want. I'll respond. What do you think of It Follows? Are you a horror fan? I did hear that this movie has a lot of references to 70s and 80s horror films, which is super cool. But yeah, I really hope you guys enjoyed this video. Thank you guys so much for watching, liking, and subscribing. I also have a letterbox if you guys are interested. So once again, thank you for watching and thank you for subscribing. Also, leave a comment if you'd like to hear me talk about a specific film. Have a good day. See you guys in the next video.